welcome you to Homemaking Radio, Housewife Radio, or Housekeeping Radio, whatever you'd like to consider it. I'm Mrs. Sherman, and I have a blog. I'm making these videos for my blog, and it is something that I'm doing to help homemakers who feel a little isolated in their work, because naturally, that is what it is. It's uh, You cannot do a good job as a homemaker in a group. It is a very isolating job, and this way... You can listen as you work. Maybe you've got something to do that's a bit tedious or repetitive, or maybe you're doing the same thing today that you did yesterday, and you'd like to hear something. I know I like to tune into a favorite uh, story from, uh, sometimes you can get these stories online on, uh, on book places where people are reading uh, an old novel, but sometimes I find them a little bit difficult to follow because they, uh, some, some of the people are uh, not clear enough for me, and so I want to create something for people who want to listen to something that has a little bit of inspiration in it, a little bit of homemaking tips, and a little bit of purpose behind it. And of course, I have my favorite novels and things that I like to listen to, and I would like to welcome you here to the manse, which uh, is a common name for the preacher's home. And I would like to say that it's such a pleasure and uh, an honor to serve you in this way. This is what I'm doing for other people. You know, I spent most of my life serving my family and still am full time at home and taking care of my own home and my own family. I'd like to reach out a little bit and, and help other people if, if this is what you want. If you find that this is not in your interest, you're welcome to go on to something else. I don't need all the people in the world. I only need about four or five as someone who would fit into my living room if I were talking to them. And I don't need a hundred comments. I only need a few. And hopefully uh, this will help you to get along. And what really helps is when you leave a comment, and you'll have to go to my blog to leave the comment because there are no blogs on the video channel. I'm not really participating too much in what's going on on YouTube. And I would like to say that you can comment there about what all you've done. This is very helpful because people that come around and are kind of looking for what 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 will help them in their daily life at home will see your comment on what all you did. And I know myself, I tend to put off things that just, they, they get pushed in a corner, things, a box that needs to be gone through, some books that need to be sorted, even old clothes. And I, I look at it, after a while I don't see it anymore. But if I have something to listen to, I can apply myself to that. And so I have three sections here. And one is, by the way, I will leave a link in my blog, uh, in the video so that, uh, description so that you can go see where my blog is. And if you don't think that blogger is taking your comment, which of course you can actually tell because, um, uh, it won't give you a message that it didn't work. It will, it will just be blank. And I have to monitor it and, and stick it on. So just give it a chance. If, however, you think that it has not taken, please go to my email on the left and leave me an email with what you want me to publish. And please re, uh, relate which one you were watching because I'll just put it on the current one and it might not have been that one. So. Anyway, it's an honor to serve you, and I want to start with, I have three things, and one is your appearance, your our preparation, and the other is your actual homemaking and getting something done at home, and the other thing is dealing with, um, with other things, your emotions and with people and with just maybe the atmosphere of the day and things, how you can cope with some of the things that you will as a person who's working this is like uh, self-employment. It's totally different. Nothing you have done in the working world or in uh, public schools or colleges can really prepare you for everything that's going to be needed to be done here at home, all the things you have to cope with. Because I'll start out with some of the things that you won't learn <laughs> in, in every place, and that is even in the home. You know, when, you, when you've been out working or you've been to schools all your life, and you have a few days at home, those are the days you kick back and you don't do anything. You don't care about your skin or your hair or anything. You just kind of like 
you don't have to and you might just kind of slough around all day in the most casual of clothing maybe not even get dressed in in your normal street clothes and uh, so the brain gets the message that when you're home it's casual but when you're a homemaker that's not the way it is we don't uh, kick back when we're at home we are alert we are making this a beautiful place and by the way I apologize for my home I haven't cleaned it up today but I wanted to come while there was no one here and my in my home it's busy there are people in and out and there are people making noise in the back of the house and so this is one of the rare moments that I get to that I'm completely alone and I have a story to tell you about that that's kind of funny and uh, so it's real easy to think, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to lay around all day. And that's why I suggest that you get ready and that you get dressed. Now today, before you go, I'm, and this is not a watch video. This is a listening video. You want to go and get some work done. But before you go, I've got a couple of things to show you. Uh, first of all, I'm wearing pony beads, and they're on an elastic, and my one of my grandchildren made them for me and there because one day I asked her could you make me some beads to wear with every color that I have that it was for my sewing but I noticed that she had left some here in her bead kit and I got to looking around wondering if there was anything purple and she must have made these for me and forgot to give them to me so I found them today and because uh, she has a little bead kit here and they just match this gorgeous sparkly cardigan that I got at Walmart probably I mean it must have been 10 years ago and it's white stag and they had them in silver and gold and I'm thinking black but this one here uh, and now I'm getting into some of the more dressy clothing that I've had for years that just kind of stays in the drawer just hangs there and you know I'm not going anywhere uh, fancy, so I'm just going to wear dress up for my home. And so I got this out. Now I will wear an apron over it when I'm in the kitchen or when I'm cleaning. And uh, another thing I want to tell you about clothing in the home, and that is your sleeves. If you've got long sleeves, that little edge around there, I, I know I have a favorite white long sleeve t-shirt that I wear in the home, that little edge around there will get very soiled. So you can make these beautiful sleeve protectors it's just you make them out of fabric and they have a little elastic here and a little elastic above the elbow and you slip them on and you can wear them over your or you can make them uh, out of more waterproof fabric but I will show you a picture of the pattern that I saw many years ago I was so enchanted with I never have made them but I will tell you you're gonna have to watch that and you can make your own spray and wash just put a little of the dawn dish detergent in a spray bottle with water and you can when you get ready to put this in the laundry you can spray the edges and let it sit there for a while before you get ready to do the laundry I just want to tell you about that I would like to make sleeve protectors and more aprons I just for some reason it's not exciting to me as making a dress <laughs> so those are the two things I get neglected the most so We'll begin with the appearance because, ladies, if you have not, if you've woken up and you're a little bit disarmed by everything that you have to do, or maybe you're feeling lonely or a little depressed, even if there are people around, or if you're living alone, that especially is important for you to get up and get dressed and go in the bathroom, get your shower, bath, whatever you do, and spend a little time when after you get dressed looking in the mirror and fixing your hair and face because it gives you a chance to look at your attitude. It gives you a chance to look in the eyes that other people are going to be looking into if you if you happen to be around p other people during the day. And if you have a family, of course, you want to live for them. You want to dress for them. There's nothing sweeter than a child saying, oh, mother, you're so pretty today. And I, I, I recall times when I have been very, very ill and I haven't been able to uh, get dressed or fix myself up that the day that I revived and I recovered and I got in the bathroom and I got all dressed up and put a little lipstick on and my, and my children would say oh, you're so pretty today you look nice I guess they got tired of seeing me looking like something the cat dragged in and so be careful to dress even for your own self-respect and for 
keep in mind you are honoring Christ when you do this. And I have an earlier video. I couldn't tell you which one it is because I don't think I was always labeling these. I have an earlier video where I talked about, I went through the Bible from the Old Testament to the New and talked about all the incidents where God talked about clothing and appearance and uh, how David washed himself and got dressed in clean clothes after a period of mourning and how, uh, you know, the New Testament talks about not walking around in sackcloth and ashes, but uh, to always put on a good, um, you know, your influence is so important. And I went through that in an older video. I can't, I can't recall which one it is, but you could probably do that yourself, too. So now we want to continue on about appearance and how important that is for the home. Now keep in mind, I will be wearing an apron over this today, but make sure your apron is clean and have several aprons. I know you can get aprons at Hobby Lobby now that are quite nice and they're very nice, nice thick fabric and they're all, I guess, half price or 40% off all the time. So I suggest you go get some of those and Make sure, if you can, wear a clean one every day and, and keep those clean and fresh, too, because even your own family are going to get a little bit tired of seeing you in the same thing all the time. So one thing that I'm doing as far as appearance goes, I'm starting to use up my clothes, clothes that have hung there for years and years. I'm thinking, what am I saving these for? And I'm just wearing them. And I've been inspired by other people that have been doing that. So that also, when I wear them out, then it'll be exciting because I can make new ones or get new ones. Now you have to also realize that changing your appearance and getting ready gives you an instant improvement. It's an instant change. You know, there's a lot of things in life that are not easy to change. And I notice one thing as having grown older that things aren't going to stay the same all the time. But they don't, it's not easy to change things. It's not easy to change your, the way you earn a living or the place that you're living or, or it's not easy to, there are some things that are just not easy to change. It's not easy to change maybe someone's personality who's uh, giving you a hard time. But some things are just not easy to change. It's not easy to, to uh, change your furniture and get new furniture just because you're tired of the old. But you can change your clothes and you can change your appearance and you can get ready a fresh new person every day. And I am old enough to remember back in the 50s when you, uh, and even as a, as a child, as a little child, I can still remember the feeling of having been given a bath, dried off, and given fresh new clothes. Uh, I mean, clean clothes, you know, maybe off the line, but the feeling, the feeling of just feeling so good and feeling so brand new. And that's the way clothing used to make us feel, is you just felt like a new person. You just had a new lease on life if you had new clothes. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the uh, the natural fibers or something, and, and they, they were just so clean, and there were no, we didn't have so many chemicals and things in the detergents. And we had uh, a soap called, I'm trying to think what it was, fuller soap, something like that, but everything felt so good. And when you got dressed, and, and of course we pressed our clothes because it was be in the days before permanent press, and that even made them feel differently. And uh, they just everything smelled so good and felt so good. And we used to have a a bottle of spray that was water with uh, something like um, lavender in it, or rose petals or something that we would put in it, and we'd spray the uh, wrinkled clothing, roll them up and stick them in the back of the refrigerator and uh, till we were ready to iron them. <laughs> I know that sounds funny. We used to do that and because they would stay moist. And then we would iron them and oh, the scent was absolutely beautiful. And, and so I'm saying today, if you're not dressed, please go and do that and, and prepare yourself and get ready for the most beautiful day of your life. Who knows? It might be the most important day of your life. It might. I believe every day is the most important day of your life. You don't need to waste it um, being morose, looking bad, feeling bad. Now, I want to show you first, before you go, the, the teacup. This 
is the only one I could find that I had that had some of this beautiful purple in it that went with my that went with my sweater today. But I have to say, now that I've learned a lot more about teacups and uh, what the ladies that come here for the ladies class prefer, that I'm starting to like the new ones better that come from Home Goods, TJ Maxx, Marshalls, and Ross, because they uh, they have bigger handles for one thing, and I have heard that they don't have so much. Uh, I don't know they I've heard that they have better materials in them and uh, but I do have this one and I'm, I'm sure it's an antique probably from the 1960s maybe 50s um, and the handle is so small and also uh, going through my my old teacups too I've had this one before on here I've done as many videos as I have teacups except for three that I'm saving to get some clothes ready to wear with them that just match perfectly for the videos so now I'm recycling and I've shown you this one before I'm not sure what I was wearing at the time but I'll put a picture of it on there so you can see and I think really if you'll start your morning out with a cup of tea it doesn't have to be Yorkshire gold like I drink but it can be a tisane it can be uh, I used to put uh, frozen fruit in here with uh, hot water it made a most aromatic sort of wonderful scent so and then the other thing I wanted to show you before you go and start working, which I wanted to remind you, you're not allowed to sit here and just watch me for the rest of the speech because this is really not a watching video. So don't tell me you don't have time to watch a video because you don't have to watch this. You just listen. Now I want to show you something from the Dollar Tree. If they've got some beautiful new raised, uh, raised stickers, and I want to get them out and show them to you. In fact, if, if my Dollar Tree were bigger and I could go get them all, I would just raid it and get them all. And so I want to show you what you can do with them. Now, I have a cardstock, and you can get cardstock, a ream of it, at Walmart. And I have a cutter, and it's just a little hand cutter. You slip your paper in it, and you cut it to the size you want. And I got that at Hobby Lobby, and it was like, half price off of nine dollars or something pretty good and this is how I would make a card and you just leave it blank in there and you can write to someone and what I like about cards and envelopes is they just fit just perfect you don't have to hunt up your envelope and if you are having a hard time finding envelopes to match your cards you go to the Dollar Tree and you buy a set of invitations that have ten in them eight or ten and then you um, you take the invitations out and use the uh, envelopes because <laughs> you know how many invitations do you need so anyway I really like this and I like a card and I can write just that much on it and send it out to someone and I like the fact that it's uh, that it's kind of dimensional like that so then uh, I'm going to I hope I have time to read you a story so we will see if we get our work done towards the end and when you're finished we might be able to do that so now I'm going to um, go on to your children because when I was talking about preparation and appearance and clothing if you ever find that your children just seem a little bit off they're not quite as hurt as they should be and they're not uh, they just seem, well, maybe, you know, children get depressed too. You know that? I would suggest you bathe them and put them in clean clothes and see how much happier they are. See how much better they are. And and keep them keep them uh, clean and fresh. It gives them dignity. Children are not little animals. They're people. They're human beings with a soul. And you have to treat them with dignity. And I believe that they should be dressed up every day. And that was one of the things that motivated me to homeschool my children because... All of my life, I went to public school, and I had heard teachers say things like, one of the reasons that children don't learn is because they have a poor home life. They don't come to school. They haven't had their breakfast. They aren't fully dressed. Uh, they've forgotten their coat, They've uh, and they haven't uh, washed, and their hands are dirty, or their fingernails are dirty, and they were talking about, and the parents don't spend any time with them, and all this stuff. So 
so when uh, my children were growing up, I thought, well, I and I and I heard that from other people when I had my children. So I thought, well, okay, I'll fix that. I'll just have a happy home life for my children. They will have time in the morning to eat breakfast. They will have time to brush their teeth and wash their hands and keep their fingernails clean. They will have time to dress in clean clothes. And we won't be rushing out the door, going somewhere else. And I won't be saying, where's your shoes? Find your books. Where's this? Where's that? Where's your jacket? And I won't be rushing around all the time taking my children somewhere else all the time. And so I decided that I would um, homeschool them because I had a, a problem with some of the techniques that were being used in school for reading and writing that I didn't think were really sound. And I didn't think that one size would fit all children. Not all children are can learn in the same manner. Some children are more audio, some children are more hands-on. Some children are more visual. And so I wanted to be a tailor-made teacher for my children, and that was one of the reasons. And I didn't want them to be, when I was growing up in public school, I was always using up my adrenaline trying to, uh, and being nervous and upset about getting things uh, done on time and trying to please the system that uh, was driving me, which absolutely I could not use anything hardly anything that I was taught because um, so mu much of it was uh, time fillers and also uh, everything was done in a group. It, it creates a herd instinct and this is one reason why it can't prepare you for home life because it's this is an isolating job and when you grow up in public schools and whether, or even private schools you uh, eat with the herd you play with the herd, you learn with the herd, you even develop a, a, maybe a language or a, a new, new phrases and sayings with the herd and uh, you kind of think like the herd. So when you get home and you decide that you need to be a homemaker, uh-oh, nothing you learned, or nothing you were educated for can prepare you for this isolation. So. So, of course, we have our children around us, and there's no reason to be isolated if you will homeschool you, and you've got your, you've got your people around you, and you, they can learn with you, and you can learn along with them. It is a hard thing to explain. No book can really tell you how to do this. Uh, it's, it, it takes some experience with your children, and you cannot influence them as well. If they are gone, most of the teachable moments of the day being influenced by other people. That's not to say that you cannot have some input from other people, but at, at least um, it, you're going to create a home life for yourself and for them, and also maybe for the future for them. Then they understand what a woman does at home all day long because they were with her. They saw. They observed it. Um, but I can remember leaving home, going away from home all day, and not knowing what in the world my mother did all day. I, I just really was that, you, you just become that out of it. You kind of don't know because you don't see every movement that they make. So now I want to, and if you're in the public school or you're teaching in the public school, I don't want to, I don't want, I don't mean to offend you, but I'm just showing you my experience. That's all. Okay. So now I mentioned the idea of being self-employed. That is so different than working for someone else because now you have to have a higher cause. You have to have a better reason. You're not just working, you know, to be working or to earn money. You're working now to preserve an entire lifestyle. You're working now to preserve an entire um, monetary system that belongs to you and belongs to your home. And you're working to protect that and to uh, create more wealth for yourself by taking care of things and by watching your uh, and I know many homemakers when I was growing up they're the ones that handled the money the men went a long ways to work and they wanted their wives to take the money and pay the bills and you know preserve their lifestyle that way so you have a big responsibility at home and so one of the things we're going to go into homemaking right now and I wanted to tell you 
one important thing. You know, we all have the, the daily work. We all have the dishes. We all have the laundry. We have to make sure the floors are swept and, and that the sink in the bathroom is cleaned and all that's everything's cleaned in there. And that, that's just kind of a daily routine we all kind of know about. And I got to thinking the other day, wouldn't it be nice if it was more than that so that it doesn't get uh, too boring. It gets a little tedious. So what I would suggest, and I suggested this to myself, do one extra thing every day. Sure, you have your dishes done. You have your laundry done. It's, it's kind of like in the Bible where, where the Lord says, you know, you've, uh, you've uh, done all these nice things. Well, what more, uh, what, uh, you know, other people do, do the same. So what more have you done? <laughs> You know, so what I would say is, okay, you get your dishes, your laundry, everything cleaned up. Do one extra thing. Clean out a bookshelf. Empty a drawer and clean it out. You know, I've got these drawers in the kitchen and every now and then I'll, you get, you open them so much after a while you don't really see the need. But the other day I opened one of those and, huh, that's getting a little bit dusty. I think I'll, and it didn't take me that long. I just unloaded it, cleaned it out and put the utensils and things in the dishwasher to give them a nice new wash and then I loaded it all back in again I only did one of them but I want to do one extra thing don't you wouldn't you like to have one box emptied or one corner redone or you redecorated you know just pull it out clean it out put a new bouquet or cloth or candle on it just do one extra thing a day. Otherwise, you're just treading water, it seems like. So it's um, like I chopped up all the vegetables and put them in containers and the, put them in the fridge that could be used for stir fries or soups or salads. And I also cleaned the fridge. That's That would be something extra because you wouldn't be doing that every day. But one of the things that I've done re regarding the refrigerator is that every time I open it, I'll look for something that needs to be cleaned or wiped or you know moved around a little bit or taken out or thrown out every day and that saves me that big clean the fridge day. You can do that too. So if you look for something else and you know we used to use that word tread water. Have you ever been swimming at the beach or at your lake or at uh, in a swimming pool and you just you know try to walk and when you tread water you don't get anywhere. So if you're just doing the daily things every day, those are really important. If you can master those, that is really great. But try to do one extra thing. Uh, make a card. Make a bouquet. And uh, I didn't bring everything that I needed to show you today. But do some extra thing. Write a letter. Uh, read something. Or just uh, you know, do, do something else, something extra that improves your home. And so now I want to move on to how to read. This is interesting. Two things I'm going to discuss regarding uh, other things besides housekeeping and homemaking. Now you can get on any YouTube website or any other place and read about more about homemaking yourself. This is mostly a listen as you work video. and I'm not going to show you how to do anything or tell you. How, how to do anything because everybody has their own methods everyone has their own way of doing things and their house is different your house will be a lot different than mine I'm living in an older place it has its own special problems and I couldn't even you could not gift me with a maid for the day I would refuse it because the maid would go crazy and I'm the one that knows all the nooks and crannies and, and what to do and they, they really they really uh, it would be a disservice to the maid to bring her in here because it's just too complicated. And there's, uh, and of course I have a few archives too that need to be um, done away with so that someone can get in there and clean. But as you get a little older, things need to be dug out and cleaned out because I know myself when I was raising the children and I was homeschooling them, I was so busy all the time with them that a lot of things just got uh, it's just easier to put things away, shove things away, and uh, not deal with them, because the children's needs were uh, at the form uh, at the forefront. So now I want to talk to you about your state of mind. 
Now, besides, aside from the fact that there will be people who will call you insane for staying home and for being a homemaker, I, I one time uh, got tired of it. You know, this has been going on for a long time. It's not just your generation, uh, but back in the olden days, people would say things like that, you know. And we were all familiar with the people that went to college and came home, but they didn't know how to pick up anything. They didn't know how to do their laundry. <laughs> and so we used to, we just sort of chuckle at it when, the, when someone would um, think that we were insane. But I know a lady who got tired of her family calling her insane. So she uh, got online and there, there are many tests that you can take and print out, you know, to find out if you're, if you're stable. I think you type in, you know, how to test to see if you're stable. And she passed a lot of them, and she printed them out, and she put them in um, frames, put them all around the house, and had a lot of fun with that. And uh, so whenever someone told her that she was insane, she would say, have you been evaluated lately? Um, and she would point to some of these certificates that, certificates that she got. <laughs> and... Uh, I think that's probably not good to allow people to do that, but nevertheless, they will. And we were, when we were growing up, you didn't call anybody crazy, and you didn't call anybody insane, and you refrained from questioning their mental state. Uh, but now everybody fancies themselves a, an amateur uh, therapist, and they want to analyze you, even though you didn't ask them to. And... Uh, so besides that, I want to, this just occurred to me recently that I noticed something about myself. And that was my posture was much better when my house was looking good and, and it was cleaned up and it was decorated the way that I like it and I could find things and everything was more organized and it gave me a feeling, a more of a feeling of dignity. And so I began to re uh, remember old books that I had read, and including the McGuffey readers, there'd be a description sometimes about someone who was, uh, it would say, the man was walking along as though he was carrying a great burden. He was stumped, he was stooped over as though he were shielding his, and his head was bent as though he was shielding himself from a driving rain. And I began to realize how many descriptions of people who were discouraged involved their posture. And even in the old, some of the older stories um, that have been made into period movies and stuff, the, the original story would read about someone who was, uh, who was defeated and their posture was, was bent. And... I got to thinking today how I could uh, uh, analyze my own mood and my own state of mind by the way I was standing. And this is how you can do it. And I should probably make a list, you know, of uh, how, how are you feeling? And it has a lot to do with the way that you are sitting and standing. It has a lot to weigh uh, with whether your chin is up or if, but, but a lot of us too, you know, We've spent many, many years kind of in a slanted position because we were helping children pick up things and we were helping tie their shoes or we were helping them get dressed or we were we were picking them up. And so we end up in a rather bad state of posture. So I would suggest at least once a day, stand up and feel up and feel like you're walking. You know, when houses had higher ceilings and we would... Uh, we felt we were in somewhere, or if you've ever been to a uh, historic home and you walk in, it just there's such it pulls you up, you know. It has such dignity, and you can look up, and it has things on the ceiling, and it has uh, trompe d'oeil and things like that, and you feel you feel taller. And so I would like you to think about that. This is just one of my wacky ideas, and that is that we can judge our state of mind by the state of our posture. And that a lot of people who have been maybe talked down to a lot or whose uh, maybe family around them are not only not supportive, but they look for every opportunity to, um, to run them down. 
that their posture becomes less, uh, less upright. You think about that for a minute, how unhealthy it is to have poor posture, because what it does, if you have poor posture, it scrunches away at your um, vital organs. You know, it, it, it depresses everything. It depresses everything, even, your, even the way your blood flows, even the way your lungs work. And it's so, so important, at least once a day. When we were younger, when we were in uh, the high schools back in the 1950s, they had a home economics class, and they would bring in films and for things like posture, and you had to stand up once a day against the wall and feel the feel the upper your upper back against the wall and just you know to get a sense of what good posture was and I just thought that that the state of your mind the state of being if you have a, a sense of well-being how different is your posture you might think about that for a while I guess whole books could be written about that so now I want to go on to leading people on to a better state of mind. One thing will flow into another. And a good a good manager of the home. You know, the Bible says that's what we're supposed to be doing, being good managers. It's always a disappointment to me. I love the Lord's Church. I love the church members. I've served them for years. My husband's been a preacher in the Church of Christ. But one of the biggest disappointments is that although we're very, very good about the gospel, and about obeying the gospel and what has to be done and about salvation and we care about people's souls and the soul is the most important thing. As a matter of fact, whenever there's a big uh, scare on the news about some disaster, about some disease or something, the first thing I will say is the greatest disaster is the loss of someone's soul. It's more important for people to obey the gospel than to always uh, you know, be safe or healthy. Yes, those things are important. But they may die, but if they die outside of Christ, that's a worse disaster. And we're really good about that in the Church of Christ. But the one disappointment that I've had over the years since I've taken an interest in Titus 2 is why aren't more of us ladies at home, and even preacher's wife, trying to fulfill Titus 2, um, to love your husbands, love your children, guide the home. And First Timothy, I believe it's 5.14, where it says the the younger women should um, should uh, keep house, bear children and keep house, and why isn't there more interest in that? Um, and it, and the potential of it has not been shown, and, and the potential potential of it is is so vast that uh, there's so much to explore, and every new generation can discover something about it. It's not like, oh, this is old hat, this has been done before. It hasn't been done by you in your era. It hasn't been done by you in your home, and that's why it's so different and unique for every person. And I wish uh, that the ladies in the Lord's Church would show more interest in Titus 2 and in training their children in Titus 2. Instead, uh, so many of them go the way of the culture, and I suppose it has a lot to do with being in school, you know, doing what everyone else is doing. But I just wanted to throw that in there. That, uh, And, of course, I know some of you are out working and not able yet uh, to be full-time homemakers. But if you have that as your goal, I think that that will be rewarded and fulfilled. Now, I've been speaking for only 38 minutes, and I don't have a big... I don't have a big program for you today, and I don't have a big lesson for you today. But if you'll remember, and by the way, may I please remind you to go get something done and not watch me. There really isn't anything, really isn't anything here to watch. I'm not that clever with the camera to do. I've seen some fascinating videos where the women are able to uh, to make the camera work so that you can see what they're making, what they're cooking, what they're cleaning, and uh, I, all I've all I've been able to do is just sit here and talk. <laughs> but hopefully my descriptions can enliven you and inspire you to to see the potential of the home. Now it is an isolating job, but there's a reason for that. There are some things you cannot do in a group. You can't. If you've ever thought that you needed company, and many of us have made this mistake, we'll think, oh my goodness, I can't stand it. It's going to be 
quite uh, isolating today, even with children around. Sometimes, you know, you just want people around. You, you get someone to come over, and after a while, you think, you know, I really need to get busy. Or maybe they're a bad influence on your family. Or maybe they have a bad attitude and it's depressing you. You're really better off to stay home and try to be a... I haven't written here what I what I wanted to say was, you know, you get these gloomy days. The reason we don't notice it so much uh, when you're somewhere else is that uh, there's a lot of light, there's a lot of busyness, there's uh, there's more noise, there's, there's nice smells and things like that. You come to the home and you don't realize you're going to have to bake something that makes it smell nice, put on the coffee, makes, do something to make it smell nice and homey, and you're going to have to light the place up, open the curtains, open the, the shutters. and But still, you might get a feeling that if you have a lot of gloomy days. But sometimes it's the way the house is built. It's the way that the, uh, the roof is, you know, putting more of a shade, in your house and the colors maybe of the way the walls are painted or the rooms the way they are uh, I know in the large open spaces the the one room you know people have talked about this where they have uh, they don't have walls anymore they just have the kitchen and the living room you look out might be a little more light in those rooms so what I would suggest you do is you have to be especially if you have children it's so important that they not get gloomy and morose and upset. You have to make sure you have enough uh, to do outside the home and in the home and you're free. You're free to do that. But for a, a, a big portion of it is you being the sunshine of your home. I know that sounds really strange but it doesn't mean that you sing songs to a troubled heart. If, if people are needing a little bit more cheer you can do that and I mentioned that that was one of the reasons that I got interested in flowers and floristry because it can be changed it's, it's something else that can be changed quite easily and quite quickly and I also do a lot of the silk flowers from oh, I don't think they're made of silk but you know the artificial flowers from the Dollar Tree because it makes a difference in the mood and the atmosphere of the home and I always look forward to after I've done a job I will say I'm gonna make a little bouquet when I get finished with this I'm gonna make do that and and I know other ladies have other other interests and other hobbies that they would like to do so I don't want to just say you have to do that and all of these are just suggestions suggestions and they're my opinions and based on my freedom of speech now I don't I don't know how many of you have followed me from the beginning where I have used the Christians on the Oregon Trail by Jerry Rushford book and I have read from it well I see my book is so far away I don't want to leave the camera and go get it. I've only got a limited time before there's going to be more noise in the house, more people around, so I want to just sit here. But Christians on the Oregon Trail, uh, this man traced through church bulletins, through letters in museums, through um, people who had relatives that had come over on the Oregon Trail, I believe, was that 1860-something? I don't have the, I'll probably try to put that down for you. And um, there's a man that's going around doing uh, little speeches and seminars to fiddle classes and to other places about history, about the history of the Oregon Trail. And one of the things he had said was that Hollywood had gotten a lot of things wrong when they did the Westerns. And one of the things they got wrong was riding in the wagon across the Oregon Trail because they didn't do that. They walked and the wagon carried their goods and uh, one person would drive the horses, the team of horses, but uh, so they walked and can you believe that? They walked. Their shoes must have been awfully thin by the time they got here, but there were places they could stop trading posts and get new things and so I ran across this little book <laughs> and it was based on Christians on the Oregon Trail. It talked about these Christians that had come across, and they're mainly members of the Church of Christ and other similar groups uh, that had gone on uh, wagon trains. A train was a series of, 
of wagons, Conestoga wagons, and they had uh, they had taken every Lord's Day off, or at least part of it off, to uh, worship, to have communion, to sing, and to have preaching. And there was always a uh, somebody that could read the Bible or preach, and uh, they would take that little bit of time off. And one of the entries in this book, Christians on the Oregon Trail, by Jerry Rushford, was someone had recorded in their diary that the wagon master and his family, they had not gotten up and gotten off on Sunday morning, and part of the group that had joined up with their train came in most indignantly, and they were young people, and they said, well, what's going on? Why aren't you up and about? And he said, well, we're taking it all, the day off because it's the Lord's Day, and we're going to, you know, everybody needs to rest, and the uh, the horses need to rest, and we need to have our worship service. And these people that were so indignant because they weren't going said, oh, don't give me that religious stuff. So you see, this kind of thing had been going on for a long time, this sarcasm about your religion and about taking the, the Lord's Day off and worshiping. He said, don't give us that stuff. I read it aloud to you in a, a few previous videos ago. And so, knowing uh, more about it from this man that was doing lectures, and uh, I'd really like to know where he's going to go next, because I, I would travel a long distance to hear him talk about the Oregon Trail. Um, and I, I don't remember who it was. I'll look it up. Anyway, so this lady wrote a book called Pioneer Ribbons. See that? And... Uh, it's by Miss Lily of the Valley. That's to distinguish her from other people named Lily. So, Pioneer Ribbons, I'm going to read you this story. Now, I want to uh, remind you this is copyrighted. <laughs> you, can't, you can't publish this and you can't rewrite it, okay? So, this is about a girl named Allison who was 13 years old, and she's traveling with her parents back in the 1800s from Missouri to, the or to Oregon on the Oregon Trail. And I reminded you that I was reminded after I moved here from Texas many years ago, it's not Oregon, it's not Oregon, it's Oregon. <laughs> They'll tell you. And I believe it was named after some... Uh, Native Indians in the area. I, I'm not quite sure where it came from, but I was looking the other day and noticing how much our uh, First Nation peoples, the which commonly called the American Indians, are represented in our land. If you look at the United States map and even the Canadian map, the rivers, the mountains, the bays, the valleys, the uh, forests, um, the and some of the towns and the I'm just, I'm trying to think, towns and cities and states often bear Indian names. They are well represented in our country. And uh, many places in Oregon, I noticed, I can't, I can't think of my, off the top of my head, but every other town is a Native American name. And so, so where was I? Okay, she was uh, 13 years old. And she, and I don't know how I got off on that subject. I have to rewind to find out. <laughs> so the other day, you know, I, I uh, put, I put something down somewhere, and I didn't consciously think about. Oh, now I'm putting this down here. I see why people talk to themselves because it helps them remember. And uh, I put something down, and I wandered off to another end of the house to do something else. And then I wanted that thing and couldn't find it. I looked everywhere for it because I couldn't put it down. So I was thinking, oh, is, this, is it time? Is it time for me? <laughs> is it time for me to go to the place, you know, where people have lost their memory go? And then somebody was so reassuring. And they said, well, my six-year-old boy did that the other day. So I felt so much better. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is about... a. A girl who travels with her family and goes across uh, to the Oregon Trail and uh, so just read a little bit of it to you okay Allison was 13 years old when she began the walk from Missouri to Oregon in the spring of 1842 
along with her mother and father. The first few uneventful days left her mind full of adventure and freedom. No more planned days at home with its hard work and regular obligations. The daily trek and search for water and safe shelter had eventually worn her enthusiasm and bright optimism down to a level of just plain tiredness. Does that sound like housework? <laughs> You know, you move into a nice house and you're so excited, but by the third or fourth day, ah, you have housework to do. In a sudden yearning for variety, Allison untied her shiny red hair ribbon that had harnessed her hair into a roll of braids and thrust it into her pinafore pocket. In this casual land, where no real society, market, or streets were to be seen, no one noticed her finery. Uh, you know, I began to realize uh, in this character development of Allison why I had told you before the people in Oregon were more casual. I think as they came out on the trail and walked that their clothing became looser and easier to wear and manage and there was no, even in some of the old photos out here, the clothing is a little different. It's looser. It's more casual. There's no finery. And I guess after walking that trail, then they arrived in Oregon where they had to start over, start up. And it was pretty hard life for some of them that uh, the clothing had to be something that really served them well and became more working clothing. The days of walking alongside the wagon were hot, dusty, and sometimes windy with sage flying about. Allison's days were becoming more simple and predictable. Her boots and her clothing and even the ribbons of her hair were wearing thin. She walked in the day and camped at night, and some singing and fiddle were heard in the distant camps at both ends of the train. She would save her satin ribbon to wear in her beautiful new life in a fine house in Oregon. Dreamily, she walked along with visions of the beautiful rivers and the valleys they were going to settle. A few days after depositing her ribbons in the pocket of her apron, thereby freeing her hair to glow in the sun and float in the wind, she met another family. They had met briefly during the signing up time and enrolled in the wagon train. The children were ages 8, 11, and 13, two girls and their older brother, to keep an eye on their safety. Pardon me, Miss Allison, said the older brother. You may remember me. I'm Sam. We are with our Ma and Pa. They told me you were 13, just like me. Yep, said Allison. I thought I was the only 13-year-old here. I didn't know I'd be walking the Oregon Trail in my 13th year. I would like to be reading books and writing long letters to my friends in the East. I'd like to be playing in the picket fenced yard with children. Now I don't feel I'm doing anything worthwhile, unless you call walking and breathing dust worthwhile. Sam continued walking beside his two sisters. Allison spoke again. Well, Sam, what kind of life are you hoping to for in Oregon? Sam hesitated, thinking deeply, looking ahead at the territory they were yet to cover. Well, a lot of things, he said. I want to do landscaping and grow the hanging gardens of Babylon. <laughs> but I can barely give it a thought, because my main goal right now is to stay awake while walking. I'm trying not to fall asleep. <sighs> what can be done, sighed Allison. Well, said Sam, in the first week we traveled behind your wagon, you had a shiny red ribbon in your hair, and it would sparkle whenever the sun caught the tails of it in the wind. It glistened as you walked, and that ribbon kept my attention, and I stayed alert. But last week there was no ribbon. I thought maybe you had lost it. Yes, well, said Allison, there's no reason for such finery out here. Why, there's hardly a colored flower among the sagebrush. No one wears such fancy things, and I put the ribbon in my pocket. Sam looked extremely disappointed. I'd give you extra water in your canteen, he said, just for wearing that ribbon again. Sam's two sisters jumped up and down with delight, and he said it would sure brighten up my two sisters. Allison pulled the ribbon from her apron pocket, tied up her hair again, and walked confidently ahead with a smile. 
Be looking for continuing Allison stories in the next edition by Miss Lily of the Valley. Now, I have, uh, there are several more of these, um, what would you call installments. And I don't want to leave her in the desert. <laughs> so I hope to read more of, uh, more of this Pioneer Ribbon stories to you. Let me know what you think. And so I've been talking for 55 minutes and I hope that you will, I hope that I've left you feeling better than when you came and I hope you got something done. And if you've been watching uh, and not doing anything, then you're going to have to listen to it again while you do something. And I hope that it, uh, that it helps. So I also want to remind you, you know, the last couple of times I've reminded you to pray about everything. And um, there was a time before when I, I suggested you do something else. Now I want you to think about being grateful for everything. Notice that I, I there was one video where I told you to notice one tiny little thing, one tiny little ordinary thing to notice it and appreciate it. So today I want to leave you with be grateful for everything, everything you have to do, everything you see, everything that you have, everything that you are, everything that uh, that is a blessing in your life and some things that aren't. Have you ever thought of some of the most gloomy days of actually thanking God for that and seeing what a difference that makes, you know? And so lead your family and your children to feel better from having been with you. And I hope that this has helped. And please leave me a comment. My donations are on the sidebar if you care to leave any money and you don't have to. I have just been asked to please mention this. That's not the most important thing to me right now. I really would like for you to leave your comments. That's wealth for me, and it helps give me some ideas. So, ladies, God bless you, and I'll see you next time. Bye.